Within the pages of this epic novel, The Scarab and the Cross, the author and storyteller Andy Garza relates an Easter story yet untold. Herein is a chapter of the not-to-be-forgotten event. Plagued by guilt and suffering painfully, the young man that built the cross on which Jesus died was pushed and shoved without mercy to the forefront of that infamous execution. He is shocked to discover that the cross he built brought about the death of the Son of God. From that realization, Onofre suffers enormous fear that God will seek him out and wreak vengeance on him for building the instrument of his only son's demise. And where does one hide from God? Well, nobody hides from God. Nobody. Within the intricate details of that historical event, our storyteller brings us to the morning after the crucifixion, the day of resurrection, the first Easter. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Coming through Jerusalem, the Egyptian and his foster son, Onofrio, met with huge crowds of shouting and screaming people. He has risen. He has risen. It's foretold he has risen from the dead. An earthquake moved the rock from his tomb. Then an angel came from heaven and took Jesus from his grave. Jews, beware. Jesus is alive. Jews, you better run. Jesus is coming. Countless cheers in many languages bounce from person to person in contagious jubilation. The announcement filled Onofrio with a great sense of alleviation and unprecedented joy. He was choked by it, speechless, trembling, and on the brink of tears. He gave the reins to Saru. The Egyptian looked at his adopted son and was happy to see what he knew Onofrio was feeling. It was exoneration in the first degree. It was freedom from guilt, free of sorrow. But being a logical Egyptian, he embraced the young man and calmly stated, I think we should verify this for ourselves, don't you? Then calmly proceeded to the tomb of Jesus. All around, the rumors ran amok. The crowds were hysterical. The cross on which he died disappeared. Stolen, removed, or confiscated by somebody. A few people said that the body was never in the chamber in the first place. Others accused the disciples of stealing the corpse. The report by a soldier that evidently had too much to drink, was difficult to accept. His followers rolled back the massive rock and stole the body. While seasoned, experienced soldiers slept without a posted guard, Saru pondered the unlikely statement in silence, while Onofrio's emotions when in reverse, he prayed to see Jesus for himself, alive and talking. Only then would his sense of guilt dissolve completely. The small wary man from the crucifixion came to Onofrio and volunteered his opinion. I personally think that the followers of this Jesus person stole the body after Joseph the counselor and the women left. Then a Jesus look-alike posed like the prophet. The women were in mourning. 
They were easy to fool in the early morning light with majestic flowing robes and a mellow voice. It was a good act to follow for someone that knew what to say. He told them to carry a tale to his gang that Jesus was going to Galilee and there they would see him again. Unless, of course, an angel really came, put the guards to sleep, rolled back the massive stone with one easy push, set on it to mock the puny strength of men, then restored life to the mutilated corpse and cheerfully rose to heaven without a blemish. For fear of being struck dead by a god, I'll have to say that perhaps, only perhaps, a miracle really happened here this morning. Still shaking his head with thoughts of his own, the wire man said his goodbyes and melted into the crowd. With synthetic calm, Onofrio gathered his courage as best he could and with bold effort walked into the silent tomb of Jesus. A few brave hearts lingered at the opening and seeing him enter that forbidden place, hid their eyes behind their hands. It gave him no joy to see the cave was empty with only a trace of myrrh floating in the air. He stood well within the cavity with fear as his only companion. A shelf had been neatly cut into the wall where the body had lain. Only a blood-stained robe neatly folded, laid there. He stiffened as he sensed that Jesus was behind him. He felt it strongly. He felt the living Jesus. He heard the sound of breathing besides his own. The sensation gave assurance, then swiftly fell away from the lack of living proof. On the shelf was a sizable blood stain. He touched it. It was dry. On the stone was warm, as though Jesus had recently laid on it. Still, he did not feel a dead Jesus. But the guilt that filled him would not recede. He looked for broken blades of grass out of place within the tomb. There were none. He found no scuff marks on the dusty floor left by those that struggled with an inflexible corpse. No smudges on the low ceiling from an oily torch. No candle stub left behind in haste. No thief would take the time to fold the robe neatly and leave it behind. It came to Onofrio that to move the massive stone would take more than one man. And it had to be done without a sound. They would have to work in total darkness an absolute silence, an impossible task to accomplish, and yet the body of Jesus was gone. He felt more than heard a soundless voice speak to his heart. Jesus lives in the hearts of all people that invest their faith in him. He felt pain in breathing and was relieved to see the Egyptian waiting for him at the entrance. Without a word said, they rode away on the morning that Jesus left his tomb. It was the day of resurrection, the first Easter. There's two sections that I would like to read to you. One is what the apostles had to say about the elevation of Jesus to heaven. As they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will return the same way that you saw him go into heaven. That's Acts of the Apostles. One. 9 to 11. Then, a poem that I have 
grown very fond of that fits this occasion. The name of the point is Away. And please forgive me if I mellow down for this. It's very touching to me. Away, I cannot say, nor will I say, that he is dead. Instead, he is just away. With a cheery smile and a wave of his hand, he has wandered into an unknown land and left us dreaming how very fair it needs to be since he lingers there. And you and you and you who so silently yearn for the old time step and the glad return, think of him as fair and on, as dear the love of there as the love of here. Think of him as the same, I say, for he's not dead, he's just away. James Whitcomb Riley, 1849-1916. It is a work deserving a place in your library. For a limited time, it is available at reader's price from Energine Publishers, Gonzales, Florida. Their phone number is 850-535-3916. Their email is P-U-B-S care of Energine, E-N-E-R-G-I-O-N dot com. It's also available through Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Books A Million. The work has received favorable praise from clergymen and laymen alike. The Scarabin Across by Andy Garson.